Welcome to the Air Gun Show. This week we're sharing some top tips to help you get the most from your night sight night vision unit. But before that, I'm heading out hide shooting in the ongoing effort to drive down grey squirrel numbers. I'm out on a woodland permission today and we're going to have a hide shoot targeting grey squirrels. Now, it's tactics that we've used before. Basically, there's a pheasant feeder here that the squirrels are raiding grain from and that's where we're going to be ambushing them. But before we make a start, let's just move over and take a look at some of the damage that the squirrels have been causing here. Right, well this young oak tree is typical of a lot of the trees in this particular plantation. Uh, it's probably not much more than 20 years old, but you can see along its bark there are some really nasty looking calluses. Now that's where when this tree was younger, grey squirrels were stripping that bark back so that they could feed on the sap beneath. It's very sweet and sugary and they absolutely love the stuff. Now the problem is that by stripping back that bark, they actually restrict the tree's ability to transport nutrients between the leaves and the roots. And what tends to happen is the branch up above that chewing dies. Now, at least it's deforming the tree. It's really not growing in a good shape now and that will reduce its timber value. But at worst, it can completely kill the tree. So they really are causing a lot of costly damage here. So let's move across to the hide and see if we can't account for a few of them. It's a pleasant spring day and just the conditions I like for the sort of ambush I've got planned. The hide has already been in place for some time, as has the feeding opportunity that I'm relying on to bring in the bushy tails. I've done all the groundwork and the weather is on our side, and if past sessions here are anything to go by, we should be in for a few shots today. Right, well this is the hide I'm going to be shooting from today. Now one thing that's probably quite noticeable to some of you is it's a fairly prominent hide because I've not bothered to dress it in with the sort of vegetation I'd usually use to help a hide to blend in with the landscape so there's no nettles, docks and the usual sort of stems that I'd use. And that's for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because the squirrels are coming to that feeder, they're really distracted by the grain and not really thinking about danger like they normally would. Now on top of that, I built this hide two or three weeks ago and it's just been left here. So it's now being accepted as just another natural part of the landscape and it's being completely ignored. Another point about this hide site, it's set up pretty close to a bunch of beehives. Now, Nicky's given me a few funny looks. I'm not entirely sure that he's very comfortable with it, but I've shot here a few times in the past and they haven't been a problem. The only thing is it's a bit of a warmer day today and they are looking pretty active, but hopefully they won't pay us too much attention. I've already mentioned that the attractor here is a pheasant feeder and they're usually a big favorite with gray squirrels. Now, of course, the pheasant shooting season ended a long time ago and since then the gamekeeper here has gradually wound down the amount of feeders that he's got set out and we've reached the point now that this is the very last one and he's just allowed me to keep it going for a few weeks extra in order to keep down those squirrel numbers and it's worked ever so well. As I already said, the hide's been in position for a few weeks now and what I did was I just left it for a week, kept the feeder going before I started shooting at all and by then the squirrels were very confident. They've literally been queuing up here and giving me lots of shots. It also doesn't appear to matter too much what time of day I come here. I've had sessions early morning, towards the middle of the day, and even during the latter part of the evening, and the squirrels just seem to keep coming. 
that feed has created a real honeypot that's offered me some very reliable, very predictable shooting from this hide, which is about 25 meters away. Now I'm just hoping that I haven't shot it too heavily and that we can get a few more today. As usual, I'm putting on my head net. The squirrels may be bold, but this feeder has also been receiving attention from crows, magpies and jackdaws, and I don't want a flash of pale skin to ruin my chances of bagging a sharp-eyed corvid. That's all of my preparations made. All I can do now is sit tight and wait for the attraction of the grain to get the better of those greedy squirrels. The session starts with a long wait, which isn't surprising considering the amount of talking I did when I arrived. But the resident squirrels have got a real taste for the grain, and it's not too long before one ventures out to raid the feeder. Well, that one certainly knew what it was after. Now, it's probably fairly apparent that I delayed for quite a while over that shot. And that's because the squirrel was bobbing up and down as it was picking up the wheat from the ground. What I was trying to do was to line up the crosshair with its head and then wait for it to drop down to feed again and then sit back up, knowing then that it would probably linger for a while with its head right in the crosshairs, enabling me to knock it over with a headshot. There are plenty of calls from jackdaws and crows, but as is often the case, the corvids are too wary to drop in just yet. We do eventually get another visitor, but this pheasant isn't on my quarry list, and it seems to be alarmed by the sight of the shot squirrel, which you can see just this side of the feeder. Well, it looked like the dead squirrel was making that pheasant reluctant to settle and feed then. Now I hope it doesn't unsettle the other squirrels because at this stage, I don't really want to break cover to head out and retrieve it. I decide to sit tight and it looks like being the right move as another squirrel eventually turns up. This one does look reluctant to settle though. And it's not an easy shot. I've set up the hide in a sheltered corner, but the wind is whistling along the woodland edge by the feeder. Well, I actually lost sight of that one when it disappeared behind the leg of the feeder and I thought it had slipped back into the woods until it appeared up on the top of the feeder. Now I'm not entirely sure why it headed up there. It may have been it just didn't like the look of that dead squirrel, but whatever the reason, it presented me with a really nice clear shot. We've got two in the bag, but the squirrels have got a real foothold in this wood and I'm confident that there are more to be had. This is another skittish one. Sometimes shot squirrels will go completely ignored, but it looks as if they're putting them on edge today.
Well, there's another one. They really don't seem to want to settle close to those dead squirrels today, and I can't say I can blame them. It looked like that one was going to clear right off, but it lingered for just a little while, and it paid the price. The crows continue to call from the distance, but still refuse to venture within range. Thankfully, there are a few squirrels to keep me occupied. It's another one that's reluctant to keep still for long, but at least the wind has calmed down a bit. Well, that was another fairly fidgety one, but it was absolutely determined to get to that grain. I just dread to think how much wheat the squirrels must steal from these feeders during the winter months when there isn't much natural food around for them. Well, the feeder's given me another good session today, but it's just been another very long, quiet spell without much action, so I think I'm going to make that do. Also, we've been here for the best part of three hours, and I'm starting to get pretty fidgety, and I just need to stretch my legs. So, I'm going to pick up the squirrels that I've had and head for home. And the squirrel crackdown continues on that permission. And now, it's the Air Gun Show News. This is the Air Gun Show News. All field sports fans are being urged to vote for shooting on the 8th of June. Major shooting organisations are mobilising their political forces after the election announcement. And while they won't tell you which party to vote for, they will say we need to make shooting's voice heard in Westminster. Bask has relaunched its dedicated campaigning website, which allows you to check local candidates' views on shooting and pick your vote accordingly. It also makes it easier for you to write to politicians to make your views known. As we all know, Brexit means Brexit, but it could also mean uncertainty for the shooting sports. The Countryside Alliance has released a Brexit policy document detailing some of the biggest political threats to shooting that could arise as we break away from the EU. It says the UK's government key policy should include maintaining tariff-free trade with the EU in firearms and ammunition, as well as game meat. And it says we should keep borders open so sportsmen can still travel abroad to shoot without facing extra bureaucracy. This includes retaining the EU firearms pass. 30,000 shooters had their data compromised by the police, who passed their addresses to a third-party agency. Metropolitan Police used external contractors to print leaflets advertising a forensic marking product for guns, and to distribute them in the post to shooters. It doesn't appear that certificate holders gave permission for their details to be given out. Basque said the home security of certificate holders may have been compromised and they were treating it as a potentially serious breach of trust. And finally, we'll see you at the Northern Shooting Show this weekend. Now in its second year, the show is set to make use of a brand new Hall 1 for the first time. It's going to be bigger and better, with backing from air gunning giants such as Daystate Air Arms and BSA. We'll be scouring the show for news to bring you a full report. When you're not roaming the aisles, come see us at the Airgun Shooter Stand, where you can also meet the editor and pick up a copy of the New Look Mag. That was the Airgun Show News.
I've been using night sight night vision units for a long time now. I started out with the NS50 about five years ago and over the last year I've been using the new Artec models in their various guises. All of them work brilliantly but there are numerous ways to optimise their performance so I thought I'd share a few of them with you. The first thing to think about is scope choice. The lens coatings that improve a scope's daylight performance can actually filter out the infrared light from the night sights illuminator and that will reduce viewing distance. Ironically, cheaper scopes tend to feature less effective coatings so they don't cause so much of a problem. That said, manufacturers of top-end scopes are working to make their optics more night vision friendly. Either way, it's worth checking how well a scope performs with night vision add-ons before you make your choice. Sticking with the scope, you also need to ensure that the ocular lens at the rear is properly focused so that the reticle is pin sharp before you fit the night sight. I also try to make sure that the parallax is set close to where I want it to be, although you can always tweak that once the night sight's fitted. When attaching the night sight, it's vital to ensure that the camera is the correct distance from the rear of the scope. If it's too close, the image will look small and blurry. What I do is start by pushing the camera sleeve all the way on, and then, with the unit switched on, I'll push the camera in and move it backwards and forwards by very small increments. You'll see on the screen when eye relief is correct. Once you've got the distance right, turn the camera to get the reticle upright on the screen and as central as possible. It's the same as making sure you're looking straight through the scope when shooting normally. It's also important to get the illuminator and screen module dead upright on the scope. If you have it on a skew, you could find yourself canting the gun. Once it's on properly, you use the focusing dial on the camera module to get the reticle pin sharp on the screen. Then the parallax adjustment on your scope can be used to focus the subject. Then it's just a matter of using the illuminator power dial on top of the screen module and the brightness dial on the front of the screen to get the display just how you want it. Keeping the scope on a lower magnification gives a wider depth of field so you don't have to refocus so much when you're out shooting. I also try to avoid winding the magnification up or down once I'm set up. This helps to avoid any confusion over aiming points if the darkness prevents me from checking the magnification with a quick glance at the scope. Some people find that the head up shooting position necessitated by the night sight screen makes for tricky shooting from standing and kneeling stances. The best way to overcome this is by supporting the gun. Lean it on a tripod, bipod or even a pile of pallets or sacks, and shooting via the screen is a doddle. Estimating range in the dark can be tricky. I do my best to get around that by shooting over predetermined distances, either by targeting rats with bait spots or by ambushing rabbits as they emerge from their burrows. Of course, if you opt for Night Sight's clip-on laser rangefinder, you can eliminate any guesswork, even when hunting on the move. And if you've got the Artec version of the Night Sight, don't forget that you can take advantage of one touch recording direct to the onboard micro SD card. That means you can capture the action from your shooting trips and watch it back when you get home or share it with friends. The Night Sight is an extremely versatile setup that combines dependable performance with very good value for money. I hope these pointers enable you to get even more out of yours. That's all for this week, but we'll be back again in a fortnight. Thanks for watching, and please don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And if you aren't already a member of the BASC, it's time you joined the organisation that works to promote and protect your sport.